So good evening, everybody, and uh, good afternoon, I guess, if you're uh, tuning in from North America. Um, it's a, a pleasure to be here with Interdental TV and an absolute pleasure and delight uh, to welcome Dr. Gabor Filo. Uh, how are you, Gabor? I'm fine, Mike. And yourself? I'm keeping very well, thank you. I am. Although I'm having to don um, a pair of my son's gaming uh, headsets. I had a, a problem with my own headset, so I've ordered a new one. And in the meantime, I'm wearing this big clunky um, gamers device. So I don't look quite as professional as you do today. Well, I think it adds a certain charm to your appearance. <laughs> <laughs> Good, good. Uh, great. So, a, a, a quick introduction, uh, Gabor. You, um, if you want to introduce, I guess yourself, where where you work. Uh, your, um, sure, I can do Hamilton, that. Hamilton. Yeah, yeah. I'm in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, right at the tip of Lake Ontario, and uh, I'm a uh, recovering amalgam smith who's gone into glass blowing. Uh, I've been at it. 36 years come April the 13th of this year. Um, and uh, my true first love, though, is, is hypnosis and dental hypnosis. And because of that, my practice base is predominantly phobic dental patients. I'm also phenomenally in love with uh, laser dentistry, which was an offshoot of dealing with needle phobes and drill phobes and I can't recommend it highly enough. So that's basically a nutshell yeah. of, of who and what I am. And, and your interest in hypnosis goes back uh, quite some time. Well, it's uh, probably about 50 years that I've been involved with it, mm -hmm. uh, well before professional uh, credentialing. Um, and I've, I've uh, been entranced, if you will, uh, by altered states of consciousness and uh, the uh, rather miraculous, if not magical, things that we can do using them, uh, both physiologically and psychologically. Yeah. And so it, it drives a lot of how I approach patients and dentistry and my own self-care. Well, this, and this is it. I mean, originally, uh, you're, you and I had, had a conversation about having a, an introduction to dental hypnosis. Um, but we realized, obviously, with uh, you know the, the dental profession getting geared up and, and ready to uh, get back to some sort of uh, dentistry, there's, there's a fair bit of stress uh, around. And, and uh, we thought, let's have a conversation about stress. It's, it's something we can talk about. Well, over the years, I've, I've done a presentation on stress management uh, using hypnotic and meditative techniques uh, at some of the larger dental meetings in North America and other places uh, around the globe. Uh, the profession is stressful enough uh, without the COVID virus adding to our, our misery. So um, I think if ever there was a need for some form of self-care uh, that is easy, cheap, um, portable, and uh, does not require a great deal of energy to master. Now is the time. Yeah, I think so. And I, and I think also bearing in mind that the, the stress that is being experienced is uh, certainly high among dentists. You know, dentists uh, can be fairly stressed anyway. And, and as you say, this is adding into the the day-to-day the -day stresses that would be experienced anyway. Um, but it's also the, the, you know, the therapists, the nurses, the, the, the wider team around us who have their own stresses, anxieties and, and worries, um, the laboratories, um, and of course, not forgetting the patients. Um, we're, we're going to be seeing patients who are more stressed because of what's happening in the world around us. I think we have to, to keep in mind uh, um, a dichotomy, as it were. Uh, when a patient comes and sits in our chair, they may be stressed, phobic, anxious, or just grumpy. Uh, they are expecting that we are going to be even keeled, collected, and focused on them and their issues alone. What they rarely uh, consider, and we tend to forget, is that 
we too are equally stressed and maybe even more so and that with that stress being present our responses to whatever the patient might uh, demonstrate in the chair may not be calm and collected and focused because of our own issues and so when we sit down at our dental chair we have to take a meta position we have to be that little angel sitting on our shoulder that is paying attention to our behavior so that whatever the patient does we aren't set off in an automatic response mm -hmm. that our response should be conscious and uh, tempered uh, and that's not easy to do in mm -hmm. today's uh, context but that's something I we should keep at top of mind I think so. And I, and I think often what isn't talked about is the fact that because there is that expectation of that demeanor um, and it's, it's becoming easier now, I think, for dentists to, to talk about having feelings and being stressed. But, but I see it almost in the same way where they talk about men's mental health generally saying, um, you know, do, do talk to people. And, and I think as a dentist, sometimes you're seen as the, the problem solver uh, rather than the person who can have a problem. Uh, you're, you're busy juggling um, lots of different things and, and to have a problem would, um, you know, that you wouldn't want to show the lose face by admitting such a thing, you know. There's no doubt about that. No doubt about that. Uh, one of our colleagues and, and friends, Albrecht Schmier uh, mm. in Germany, uh, he always had a clinical psychologist on staff in the practice. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the benefits of that I think not just for the patient, but, but would have been the fact that the staff could approach him and have whatever uh, resources instantly as opposed to having to go outside of the facility. Uh, the other thing is that we should keep in mind that if we're going to talk about things, um, sometimes a good friend will do, a religious leader in your, your parish or community. Uh, <laughs> And as, as, as facetious as it may sound, even a good bartender. Uh, but failing that, uh, most uh, dental organizations globally uh, have uh, organizations, uh, member uh, assistance programs where there's somebody you can make a phone call to about whatever issues bothering you, and they will give you assistance. Uh, here in, in Canada, it's the Canadian Dental Service Plans Incorporated, uh, which has a program and is part and parcel of membership uh, with your insurance plans. So that uh, uh, if you have an issue, suss out in your neighborhood whomever might be offering this kind of service. Yeah, indeed. I mean, the, the British Dental Association uh, have a similar thing. And there's also been a, a recent helpline set up called Confidential, uh, which does the, uh, the same thing. You can confidently phone up uh, or confidentially, sorry, phone up for advice. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the descriptor in the video, either on YouTube or Facebook, you'll see a number of different resources and places where, where people can phone, uh, ranging from the ones specifically for dentists to obviously generalized um, helplines, even the Samaritans, you know. Cer certainly uh, a necessity in today's uh, context. Yeah, but I think when, when it comes to, I guess, discussing um, uh, the, the daily general stress that everybody will encounter, there are obviously some key differences between that and somebody who is suffering from, for example, clinical depression or high levels of generalized anxiety. You can have stress associated with these things, but those are, are kind of separate things, would you say? Uh, they, they, they can be separate and then they can also comorbid. be in, comorbid. Yeah. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, there is a, a connection between chronic stress and uh, mental health issues. Yeah, but I think that one of the key things in having this discussion is not to belittle uh, somebody who has long-term chronic depression by simply saying, if you do these simple things, then this is going to solve the issue because it's, it's more complicated, uh, perhaps. Well, let's let's put it in, in, in sort of a clinical context. Uh, depression is considered self-limiting self in, in about a two-and-a-half-year term. 
unfortunately, in today's world, who's got two and a half years before you get out of bed? Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's not it's not feasible. Um, if you go seek out professional help, uh, which is the right thing to do, uh, psychiatry will give you medications. Depending on the psychiatrist, they might also be into talking therapies. Um, but you may also at the same time need a psychologist who will give you uh, coping strategies for your your day-to-day -day existence. And it's not something that you can fix with a simple uh, uh, do-it-yourself technique. There's far more biochemistry at work that has to be contended with than just simply trying to fix it at home on your own. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're dysthymic, which is a subclinical form of depression, then there is the possibility that things that you can do on your own might get you through the problem um, faster and with less less uh, uh, difficulty. But talking to a professional is something we should always keep top of mind, whether it's personally or whether it's for one of our patients. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I was thinking um, about... Um, uh, oh, yes, I should also say, if anyone does wish to leave any messages or questions, uh, Christine has said hi. Hello, Christine. Um, if anyone wishes to leave any questions, please pop them up and um, we can answer them as, as we chat. Um, as long as they're clean, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> I might, well, even if they're not. It's, uh, so, yes, we're talking about uh, stress. So I found a, a, a slide that I sometimes use when I speak to um, newly qualified dentists. Uh, the, the definition I often uh, use is stress being a condition or feeling experienced when a person perceives that demands exceed the personal and social resources that the individual is able to mobilize. Um, and I think that, you know, for me, that sums it up um, fairly concisely. Is that is that a definition you would uh, agree generally covers most of the points? Well, most definitely. Uh, however, being the sort of mind that I am, I prefer to look at the, the, the history of stress, if you will. Okay. Um, evolutionarily, stress, the stress response, that is uh, having a diminished focus, that is having enhanced uh, auditory capabilities or a diminishment of them if there is a tremendous amount of external uh, noise going on, the fact that you become fight or flight oriented all of this is fundamentally there to ensure your survival. Now, depending on the context, and this is where the, the, the social part of the definition comes in, it may be a totally and absolutely appropriate thing. It's like anxiety and fear. If I'm walking in the woods and suddenly I'm approached by a bear, uh, having a fight or flight response is appropriate for my survival. If I walk into a dental operatory and have the same response, blind terror uh, uh, coupled with a focus to see what in my environment is going to kill me, whether it's the dentist or the assistant, um, that's an inappropriate response. Uh, so that there is a very, very close relationship between fear, anxiety, and phobia, as well as stress. And uh, my observation, and, and I can't give you science to prove it, but the period of time from which acute stress becomes chronic, you're going to get all of these other mental health related issues cropping up in a very comorbid fashion. Uh, so the object is to cut it off at the um, pass, as it were. Yeah. Yes, that's uh, that's obviously a good definition there from uh, from Christine as well. Thank you, Christine. I fully agree. Yeah, and uh, hi to Libby as well. So, um, 
Yeah, so as, as a definition, one of the things I quite like as well is the, the concept of what is known as the, the stress bucket. Is this something that you have heard of? I'm sure you will have. I've, I've heard of it, and I know you have a slide. Uh, I have a slide. You might want to put that up. I have to come peek around the side here. So this is the slide. Uh, I'll try and hide. There we go. Let me... <laughs> so I'll take that banner away. I'm going to put up uh, the banner for where I got this. So I got this from uh, this website, which has a little blog uh, about it as well. Um, if anyone wants to go and see the original. Now, what I like about this model, and it, apparently it comes from a, a, a paper in 2002, is this concept that, let me get my finger right, how can I point? So if you can see at the top here, um, this, you have things coming into your stress bucket. Now, the, the, the first thing to mention is the, the stress bucket is, a, I guess, a metaphor for your ability to deal with stressors. And these stressors can be uh, a variety of different emotional factors. It can even be physical or he health problems. Um, it can be anything which causes your body stress. So in this particular example, you can see, you know, worries at work, poor diet, financial, lack of sleep, family relationship issues, health concerns. So we all have these stressors that pour into our bucket and some of the taps are on far faster and far fuller uh, than other ones. Um, the concept of the stress bucket is that everybody has a, has a different size of bucket that they originate with. Some people have got a huge bucket and they just seem able to cope with uh, an inordinate amount of stress and, and it seems to not affect them. Other people have got a very, very small stress bucket that, uh, that fills up very quickly. Uh, the other consideration being you can have a huge stress bucket, but it can be uh, it can be almost at the top and, and just turning on one tap, one small issue, all of a sudden uh, you get the mess on the floor and things are overflowing. And of course, the mess on the floor when things overflow are the symptoms of stress. It's when people tend to snap um, and, and have issues. In this particular diagram, I quite like it because it shows the, the lines of, you know, you're relaxed, you're your bucket's starting to fill up, but you're coping, you're starting to become stressed, and then the point where it, it uh, overflows. Now on the side here, on my side, you can see there is a, a tap, uh, but this tap represents um, unhelpful coping mechanisms. So these are things like um, either over or, or under eating, um, disruptive sleep patterns, it's, it's alcohol, tobacco consumption, recreational drugs, which seem to, uh, release a pressure valve and, and seem to make things feel better for a short amount of time. But actually what's happening is they are feeding directly back in um, to the, um, the infill, if you like, because they cause other problems. Um, at the bottom, you can see the outlets and the outlets are um, a wide variety of things which allow us to keep um, everything within the bucket. So this is taking time for things you enjoy, mindfulness, meditation, hypnosis, um, talking to friends and family, good time management. It'll also include having a good diet, uh, good sleep patterns. And these are things I often say to people if they're feeling stressed, the very first thing really to think about is, is get your diet sorted out, start to eat well, and set yourself um, regimented sleep patterns. This is when I'm going to go to bed because once you're eating well, and once you're getting a good number of hours of sleep, things can then start to build. You're already releasing some of these issues at that point. So I quite like uh, the concept of the stress bucket as a, a kind of model, um, if you like, an explanation um, for stress. Um, what do you think? Do you like uh, do you like my my stress bucket? I, I think it's a very nice uh, description of what we go through. Yeah. yeah. Um, Fundamentally, anything that works is is great. Yeah. Uh, as as a metaphor, uh, I don't know about you in your dental school days, um, uh, but in my in my days, which now are a few years ago, um, and I, from what I can tell, not much has changed in those days. Uh, none of this kind of thing was ever addressed. Uh, yeah. Uh, you were just either taken, uh, considered to be uh, uh, doing this on your own and, and already had it sorted out or, or not. Um, but it's, it's um, uh, 
really quite distressing. Yeah. I, I, I have a, um, okay. I had a wonderful slide I'm trying to find here. Okay. You uh, find that and I'll answer Christine. Well, you have a look, Christine. I, yes, there's a number of things I would say that affect the size of your stress bucket, um, upbringing, um, certainly, um, also things like, um, previous experience in dealing with stress. Uh, if somebody has got coping mechanisms they have learned in the past, that will also increase the size. There's a huge number of factors that are involved in uh, the, the original size, if you like, of that stress bucket. Did that answer the question? I don't know, did it? <laughs> did, did you have a slide? <laughs> yeah. Mercifully, I found the slide. I'll, I'll see if I can't share the screen. Okay, all right. Uh, what's this doing? Just share the screen. Uh, you probably have to double, double click it. You're looking stressed there. Are you okay? Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> me and technology. <laughs> now is, Thanks. is, Thanks, is anything show, is anything showing up? No. No. Oh, well, that's just, a, just a slightly closer image of you. Oh, well, that's a frightening <laughs> thought. Is anybody else stressed by that? <laughs> I have to say, that I'm going to ask you this question. Nobody has sent it in, but uh, I'm going to ask you, um, how is your PPE going to work with uh, with your moustache? How's that? Uh... Yeah, well, I sadly, I can't be fitted for a uh, uh, an N95 mask, which is, I guess, equivalent to your, what is it, the, how many Fs and Ps do you have in it? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what I have done is I'm double masking. Okay. I have a mask which is good to 2.5 microns, mm -hmm. over which I put my surgical mask, which in theory is good to 0.3 microns, like an N95. Um, and then we're supposed to have a face shield to boot if we're uh, generating an aerosol. So okay. uh, mind you, all of this is going to become apparent tomorrow. Um, okay, of course. The first day back after three months. Indeed. Now, is anything showing? Yes, I can bring that slide up. I was actually wondering if uh, I've seen okay. a YouTube, I've seen a YouTube video of a guy with a huge beard, and he, <laughs> he kind of rolls it up and tucks it away, and he it disappears. And I just wondered if there was some uh, origami with the with, with the beard. <laughs> well, I've tried that with with my N95 mask. <laughs> um, it, it's it's a bit it's a bit of a challenge. Let's put it yeah. that way. Yeah. Um, there I, you go. If, if you're seeing the whole screen right now. Yeah, this is the uh, uh, acute stress, which uh, demonstrates where uh, the activities take place. And this, in theory, once the stressor has either abated, diminished or left your environment, uh, these should all be then redirected uh, or controlled by the parasympathetic nervous system kicking back in to modulate things. But unfortunately, uh, what happens over time is that uh, we end up with chronic stress where the parasympathetic hasn't been able to dampen down the sympathetic nervous system sufficiently. And to a great de degree, it's the cortisol that is now constantly bathing our cells. And we end up with, with the impact on all aspects of our being. Um, and then at the very bottom here, I don't know how well you can see it. It's uh, slightly it's slightly off screen, actually. Are you able to just uh, play the PowerPoint slide? Because that should... Uh... This is the, the full oh, is version. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know how else to get this better on screen for you. That's okay. Um, at, at any rate, uh, it's this bottom little square here, the adverse health outcomes. Okay. Uh, where hypertension, diabetes, coronary heart disease, GI issues. Um, that that's okay. that's the, the the issue that's going to do us in ultimately. Mm -hmm. And uh, I speak from personal experience, uh, both from a genetic predisposition to all of those good things. Uh, instead of money, I inherited everything else in the family. Um, to also picking dentistry as a profession. So yeah. what, what can one say? Um, at, at the office, uh, every lunch hour, if I'm, if I'm in the building, I spend an hour 
in my head meditating or practicing some variant on self-hypnosis so that I can mitigate my, my uh, physiologic responses. Um, and then one of the things that I think you addressed earlier was exercise. Yeah. Uh, I, I would recommend, especially as you become part of a more senior demographic, wasn't that a tactful way of saying getting older? Um, <laughs> Picking an exercise which is uh, low stress on the joints but beneficial. Now, I've been practicing Tai Chi for 30 years, um, and I can't recommend it highly enough because you can practice it anywhere. There's no special equipment necessary. A uh, couple of square feet of space is all you need. Um, and it becomes moving meditation if you're doing it right. And studies have demonstrated a very positive effect on everything from the immune system to uh, the heart and, and uh, your vasculature. So pick that, pick yoga, Pilates, some very uh, low stress demanding exercise mm -hmm. which you can practice on a daily basis in, in this last three months i've practiced more tai chi than i have in the previous 30 years yeah. um and and i'm tickled pink that i've had the opportunity if nothing else yeah for, for me one of uh one of my stress management techniques is fly fishing uh, so there's a degree of uh, Tai Chi that, that comes with that, the, the, the movement. And I, and I rarely bother the fish. <laughs> um, but actually being, being standing by the river and, uh, you know, seeing a kingfisher and, and the noise of the river, it, it, it really, it's, it's an amazing feeling. And actually it's the reason why I bought the house where I am because the river is literally at the end of the garden. So I intentionally bought the house that had my own, uh, mental escape, uh, if you like. My own special place is literally at the end of the garden, and I can grab a whiskey or a coffee and um, saunter down. We obviously think alike. Uh, my house is uh, backs on to a conservation area. Okay. So you name the critter, it comes and lives in my backyard from deer <laughs> to chipmunks. So uh, uh, there is something about hiding in nature. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that's something the Japanese call it nature therapy, basically. Um, and it's something that our artificial lifestyles uh, also add to our stresses because we are divorced from the rhythms of life. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm an avid Boy Scout leader. Um, I've been at it for 56 years. Uh, and uh, every year, unfortunately, COVID has prevented it from this year. Uh, but I go to camp. Uh, mm -hmm. our, our central training camp is in New York State. And within a day, your biologic rhythms, your circadian rhythms, and your ultra dian rhythms adapt to functioning with the rhythms of the day. Mm -hmm. Reveille is at first light, which can be at five in the morning. By nine o'clock, when the sun goes down, you can, uh, if you're paying attention, you, you can become aware of how the body is now beginning to shut down for um, uh, an evening's rest. Mm -hmm. So that being in nature is phenomenally uh, beneficial. It, it really is. Do you know, I even um, uh, did something a while ago. I set up a video camera and I recorded an hour of footage just from the side of the river in my garden. And I actually did that for each season. And I've put together mm -hmm. a four-hour four video that I have on YouTube. And if I'm at work or if I'm somewhere where I can't be by my river, I can still tune in and uh, and get my dose. Well, having seen your backyard <laughs> and your river, I, I understand fully. Yeah, well, you can now visit. I'll send you the link. I'll put it up in the. <laughs> <laughs> Let okay. me know. So, um, I guess before we get into some uh, some of the techniques that we've both learned um, over the years that may be helpful, um, when it comes to the, I guess the signs and the symptoms of stress, um, I, I've taken a, a short note of some things here, but we all recognise what a lot of these things are from personal experience. 
And I think being in tune with this just now, as we go back to work and we have our colleagues around us, I think it's ever more important to be able to be observant and to recognize if you're seeing any of these signs in your colleagues and actually just to ask them, are you okay? Is everything is everything all right? Even if they're even if they seem to be um, uh, coming across as aggressive or short tempered with you, it may be a sign of um, stress. Their their buckets full and ready to overflow. Um, I often will have this conversation with patients because anxious patients can sometimes come across as being a little aggressive or a little short tempered, but actually it's because their stress bucket is right at the top. And if you keep them three minutes late. Um, that's another tap, and it's it's all over the floor at that point. <laughs> so recognizable signs and symptoms: uh, irritable, anxious, um, racing thoughts, uh, not not enjoying things, feeling depressed, um, losing a sense of humor, um, feeling dread, feeling worried, feeling lonely, um, and the behaviors that people might uh, uh, display would be a difficulty in making decisions. Um, avoiding troubling situations, short-tempered, um, an increase in parafunction, so nail biting, skin biting, um, uh, smoking or, or eating habits changing, uh, a lack of concentration, amnesia, feeling restless, um, perhaps getting tearful and, and crying. Um, and then the physical aspects, uh, the list I have here, panic attacks, uh, sleep issues, uh, loss of libido, feeling tired, um, a change in bowel movements, either being constipated or um, being too frequent, diarrhea, uh, headaches, chest pains, high blood pressure, indigestion, heartburn, feeling sick and feeling dizzy. It's quite a, um, quite a list. Now, I think one of the features of that list is the overlap with anxiety, uh, not as a mental health issue, but just generalized anxiety that people would have. Mm -hmm. the, of course, the concern is that this is going to become a chronic problem, yeah. which then is going to be very hard to to uh, ameliorate. Mm -hmm. Indeed. So obviously, we you know there are a lot of things that are going to be causing uh, people stress just now within all of the health healthcare professions, and, and we're not here to discuss. Uh, PPE and we're SOPs and all the other things that are causing large inflows of, of water into people's buckets. Uh, but really to talk about what are some of the, the things that we've learned over our, I've, I kind of worked at our, our combined 75 years of uh, um, study and, and work within the field of hypnosis, because when we learn hypnosis, we learn a whole range of techniques that actually can be applied while a patient is in trance, but also can be applied as a, a straightforward single takeaway technique. I think we should look at, at uh, the simplest method first, and that would be breathing. Uh, most of us, uh, I mean, if you have children at home, you know that when they're infants, they have a very uh, diaphragmatic breathing pattern, mm -hmm. which as they become older and, and in theory more mature, uh, becomes the thoracic breathing pattern that we have. And, and uh, when you're stressed and anxious, that becomes very, very evidently thoracic. So I think if we look at any tradition in meditation, and even in some of the relaxation-based hypnotic inductions, it all starts with breathing. Yeah. Um, now, for those that, that encountered yoga in some capacity, there are 50 different breathing techniques. And if you're going to do that and have not had experience, I would find a good teacher for, for those. Um, if you're into uh, Tai Chi and Taoist thought, as, as I am, um, I happen to be very fond of their breathing technique, uh, which is – a somewhat different in in general and and one of the simplest breathing techniques is just to take a deep breath and expand your diaphragm and we've all done that and uh, there have been studies that show that four deep breaths a day which isn't particularly a lot are sufficient to uh, modulate your blood pressure so if you're going to do it consciously uh, the one that I the method I enjoy is uh, 
the Taoist approach, and Pilates has, has also taken advantage of this technique. And it, it bases itself uh, on a visualization and an awareness of your air pattern. So you'd sit comfortably, you'd inhale, and the object would be first to feel the air going down the back of your throat. Now, as clinicians, we always want to inhale through our noses. And that's for uh, the production of nitric oxide, which is crucial to our hypertension uh, maintenance uh, in general, and is, is generally speaking a very important biomolecule. So you're going to inhale through your nose, you're going to exhale through your mouth. And the object is to feel the air go down the back of your throat and into your lungs. And with each inhalation, you're going to observe the breath pattern and you're going to increase your thoracic cavity, but you're not going to change the position of your diaphragm. So what you're ultimately going to do is you're going to have the air go in. You're going to be aware of it as it increases your lungs sideways, as your lungs push against your back, and as the uh, tops of the lungs uh, push up against your collarbone. And you just keep breathing in this fashion, but you don't change the diaphragm's position, at least not consciously at any rate. And you do this and you let it cycle. And ultimately, you want to be able to do this in a continuous motion that is inhaling and exhaling without stopping in between. Mm -hmm. And the whole exercise should be very, very gentle. There shouldn't be any straining. Yeah, that's, that's actually, uh, I mean, it's a great technique, but one of the, the points you made there is something that I teach um, patients with a strong gag reflex, which is the importance of avoiding holding your breath and, and have that continuous flow of breathing. Um, yeah, very important. Is there anything else you'd you'd suggest for for breathing techniques? Um, well, I certainly I came across uh, a, a few years ago the the four four eight breathing technique, um, and that is the the concept of breathing in for the count of four, holding the breath for a count of four, and then breathing out for a count of eight. Now, obviously, this is um, a, a, a short term technique. Uh, I believe it is very good for. Um, uh, somebody who is having a, a panic attack. Um, it will help to bring somebody down. Um, I also wondered as well, and I wonder what your thoughts are on this, because I believe um, that there is a physiological switch which happens when you adopt this breathing pattern with regards to the, the kind of switch between parasympathetic, sympathetic uh, systems is what I read anyway. Um, and... Um, I, I, I wonder as well, because when you think about the breathing pattern 448, it actually is very similar to a smoker's breathing pattern when they're inhaling a, a draw of whatever substance is relaxing them. And, um, and, I, and I just wonder, is the... I wonder if the physiology of smoking and that breathing pattern may actually be part of what uh, is relaxing the person as well. Well, I can't give you an exact opinion but if if i uh, i'm going to think about it with what little i remember from my dental school days um exhalation is a reflexive muscle relaxation so there's no uh sympathetic activation if you will mm -hmm. and if you consciously extend that exhalation i would imagine that you are are inviting your parasympathetic system to engage longer than it yeah. would. Yeah. So it, 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 it doesn't surprise me. Um, and the, the very fact, I think, that uh, you're consciously controlling your breathing pattern, uh, I think, switches on the parasympathetic nervous system. Because yeah. when, you're, when you're anxious and thoracically breathing in a very high manner, first, yeah. it's very hard to keep that up intentionally. Yeah. Plus, you're going to be, become hypercapnic and probably faint. Um, so the, the very conscious act of control, no doubt, enhances that parasympathetic uh, overdrive. Yeah. And do, you, do you think that obviously focusing on a breathing technique in, its, in itself 
is giving an element of distraction because you're you're taking uh, I guess your conscious awareness into an activity rather than the internal dialogue. There is a um, definition of hypnosis and meditation by uh, Dennis Weir, who wrote a couple of books on the subject, um, which I, I don't recommend to novices that might be interested in the subject area. But uh, the the definition of, of an altered state of consciousness or altered state of mind is a repeated thought object. Hmm. Um, and as, as long as you continue to have a repeated thought object, you're going to set up a meditative state. Now, that thought object can be anything by definition. That can be focusing on your breathing. That can be a mantra, oh, which, again, is merely a glorified exhalation with a, a, a vibration of your vocal cords. Um, so that as soon as you have a repeated thought object, it's meditative. Mm -hmm. If you then add an external thought or sound or comment, it becomes hypnotic. And that can be generated by your environment or that can be generated by, by you adding an extra level of awareness to your ongoing thought process. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, if you're breathing and focusing on your breathing, you are automatically self-inducing a change in, in, in conscious awareness. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of the other uh, breathing techniques that I've used uh, a, a lot over the years is the, the colored breathing technique. Um, and it's very good for folk that are, are good visualizers. Um, the, the concept is the the person will, um, I guess, think about where they're feeling the stress or the anxiety, uh, whether it's their stomach or they're getting it in their shoulders or, or in their head, um, and they conceptualize it as a color, uh, usually a, a, a negative color. So they'll usually think of kind of uh, a blackness or a dark red kind of color. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the, um, I, I then asked the person what you know what is a nice relaxing color what's your favorite color uh, and the whole um, concept of the idea is that the, the person as they breathe out will visualize that the the negative color from their stomach or their shoulders is draining out and they expire it and it as it leaves their body, um, they, they imagine a colored vapor that um, just starts to evaporate and, and disappear uh, with each breath in, they breathe in the preferred color. They feel that color enter their lungs and then travel through the body into the shoulders, into the head, the legs, the stomach, uh, wherever they, they, they need to feel it. And again, it's, it's a nice focus uh, as well. And, and the, the added enhancement there um, is the addition of a visualization to a physiologic response. So you've now essentially uh, if we want to go with that model I just described you're essentially having uh, a, a basic uh, repeating thought object that is the breathing with a secondary layer on it which is mm -hmm. the visualized color yeah. the third layer is actually the elimination of that mm -hmm. so that you're, you're setting up uh, several layers of uh, mental change if you will uh, which should be enhancing your, your parasympathetic drive. Yeah. And again, what, what I love about hypnosis is that, you know, within uh, hypnosis workshops and books, uh, there are hundreds of these types of techniques. Oh, um, millions. Yeah. I mean, one of, the, one of the things that reminded me of was a technique that uh, one of our late colleagues from Boston, uh, Harold Golan, an oral surgeon, uh, who used to be the uh, president of the American Board of Hypnosis and Dentistry, uh, he called it the smiling technique. And every morning you would get up, you would take a look at yourself in the mirror, and then you would visualize smiling or sending a smiling thought to each one of your major organs. Mm -hmm. The technique actually hails from the Orient, and it's much older. It's, it's an early meditative technique. But Harold popularized it, oh, God, when I was in my training shorts uh, in dentistry. So <laughs> um, there are millions of these approaches. 
and, and they they all work quite nicely. One of the techniques I like to do, uh, again, it hails from Tai Chi and has a lot of uses, but it's a very nice, simple little technique, which I prefer to what's known as the uh, Calvin Klein uh, or Calvin Stein, rather, clenched fist technique. Yeah. Um, the idea that I'm going to stand at a checkout counter in today's world right now, clenching my fist to have all the stress there uh, and then letting it go. I'm sorry, that's a little too obvious. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas this technique, nobody will ever see you lift your fingertip. Okay. And all you do is you raise an index finger sufficiently that it feels different to the others. And what's really nice is that you're focusing on the body without making any changes to it. Mm -hmm. You're focusing on the actual physical sensations in your finger, M muscle tension, ligament stretch, circulation, thermal currents around the finger, proximity to the other digits. If you're keeping your hand on a, on a desktop, the, the sensation of, of the space between the finger and the desk. You're actually physically focusing on the physical sensations in this finger. Now, using that definition I gave, the finger becomes the thought object. And mm -hmm. each and every component of it, like submodalities in neurolinguistic programming, you are now looking at all of the, the components of that finger it becomes the only thing in your field of awareness. And when you've reached that point where you're not aware of anything else in your body, you can start relaxing your entire being from that point. You can do it physically, mm -hmm. or you can do it psychologically, where all of a sudden you're letting the sensations just ebb away, and they can go through mm -hmm. that fingertip if nothing else. It has other mm -hmm. uses, but we, there's no... Uh, time at the moment to, to go into them yeah christine's laughing at you about for saying calvin klein instead of calvert stein so don't, yes. don't, don't 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 touch your calvin kleins if you're in the queue in the supermarket <laughs> either you'll get into trouble for different reasons yeah. well as soon as i said it i, I realized the, the uh, uh, freudian slip shall we say <laughs> I ever wondered about that? What kind of slip did Freud actually wonder about it during his day? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, having having said all that, <laughs> um, yes, and, and in fact, the that that concept is is similar to how we will sometimes utilize anchoring techniques as well. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's a, a, a physical sensory. Um, um, technique that can be used that can help to shift how you're feeling. Um, I'll often explain anchors um, to my patients and, I, and I'll refer it to it as almost like a, a bank account of positive feelings. Okay. Now, the, the only way to be able to access these positive feelings is if you've built them into the signal. Now, I, anchors um, are, are like triggers, I guess, and most of the time we experience them. Um, it's it's a, a spontaneous thing. It's not nothing that's been set up. It's just happened naturally. So the, the a particular smell of cooking scones that that takes you back to your grandmother's house when you were nine years old. Um, it can be negative as well. You know, the patient that says the they walk into the, the dental um, uh, office and they get the smell of the dentist and the bad feelings are suddenly triggered. Um, so it's something physical. It can be music. It can be the smell of a, an aftershave or perfume, <clears throat> a hug. All of these things create emotions uh, and are, that are then anchored um, within us. Um, and for that reason, they can be uh, reaccessed. Again, if you've never set up an anchor, then it will only ever happen uh, spontaneously and in a random way whenever you encounter that particular trigger. Um, I, I think one of the things that you're, 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 you haven't quite said yet, but I, it is worth mentioning, is that there is a need to be aware of what an anchor is, how mm -hmm. easy it is to generate an anchor, mm -hmm. which is why when we're doing our thing in the operatory, we have to be consciously aware of everything that's going 
about the patient. Yeah. Um, and one of the nice gestures, which is something I learned from my buddy and mentor, Vic Rausch, to put Victor into context, he had his gallbladder out with nothing but self-hypnosis back in the mid-70s when they flayed you like a fish before uh, microsurgery was even dreamt of. Mm -hmm. He walked off, he, he got up off the table and walked back to his room after the surgery. Uh, he's done all, I have videotapes of him doing all sorts of other things to himself, uh, surgical extractions of, of fractured sevens and cysts and things. Um, and one of the, the nicest anchors and the easiest anchor, you have a, 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 a patient in the chair, regardless of how the appointment went, before you s sit up the chair, you put your hand on their shoulder and you compliment them on how well they've done. You've now set up a double anchor. If you use your, your voice tonality to emphasize uh, the phrase of how well you've done, as well as the, the hand on the shoulder, you've got two uh, sensory modalities anchoring a positive uh, emotion in the patient yeah. so the next time they sit in the chair you can trigger all of that by just putting their hand your hand on their shoulder and telling them we're going to have another wonderful session together indeed indeed and um, but and of course you you can learn the anchoring techniques oh, uh, God, yes. I, 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 and there's again there's a a huge range of different signals and, and things people can can set up for their anchor uh, i tend to like the old uh, finger either the yes. middle or the index finger together because somebody can be standing in the queue or sitting in the waiting room and quite easily and i will if any of my uh, my team will see me before a, a particularly difficult patient. Um, you might just notice a little uh, finger signal uh, before <laughs> the person walks in the room. Um, but as I say, you have to you have to program in the um, the emotions that you're looking to tap into have to be programmed in. Now, when I first learned this technique, when I studied hypnosis, it was taught in a, a capacity of imagining you were relaxing on a beach or somewhere calm. And, you know, that, that was okay. It worked to a degree. What I then realized is by actually programming and adding things into this uh, technique as they happened. So, you know, you're standing at the football ground and your team wins the, the big game. You press the anchor. Uh, somebody compliments you for, um, thank you, you saved my teeth and they look beautiful. Thank you so much for the hard work you've done. You, you press the anchor. Every time you get the positive energy and the positive feeling, you press the signal because you're putting that into your bank account. It's adding, adding, adding. Now, the moment when something's going wrong or it's, it's first thing on Monday morning in the you know, a new world of PPE and stress and, and you know, the, hopefully the patients actually turn up for their appointment. I saw a great meme with the guy all donned uh, in, the, in the PPE quit, kit saying, what do you mean the patient's cancelled? Um, <laughs> so, <Well, it> <laughs> so there's... Within yeah. that, within that moment, um, when, when you're feeling the anxiety, feeling the stress, um, you give yourself that signal. Now, the, the the signal is never meant to take you from being in a situation where something stressful is happening to pressing this and thinking, "Well, I don't care because everything's fine." But what it does is it neutralizes, it brings you back, you know, to the realms of where you feel like you're coping again because you think, right. I, I, I've got evidence, I know I can do this, I know I can be calm, and I know I'm good at what I do, and this is going to be fine. I think, too, if, if you think of, of firing off your signal as a method of regaining control, when you have a sudden stream of anxiety and stressful thoughts, which in, in the East is the monkey mind, shattering yeah. away incessantly into the future, setting up more anxiety. When you take the, the initiative and fire off your signal, you've done two things. You first uh, focused internally on your own volition. It's not your monkey mind chattering. You're now taking control. Mm -hmm. Secondly, this is an induction cue to reify a series of uh, 
altered states of awareness or mindset, which you used when you actually anchored each of those positive emotions. And so you're, you're consciously going f from, a, 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 we'll call it a sympathetic trance state to a parasympathetic trance state where you're in charge and in control. And it will mitigate your situation enough or should mitigate it sufficiently so that you can then take control of whatever it is that's causing the stress yeah. without melting down. Mm -hmm. Well, absolutely. And I, and I highly recommend this type of technique. I've, uh, I've, I've taught it to hundreds of people. My, my children all know how to do it. If they have a, a swimming gala or a test at school or the first day at school, um, they, they know how to um, access their anchor. Now, when you do anchors, uh, mm. my, my habit has been to have a patient generate at least three different experiences from their past, which again yeah. is uh, an induction technique internally, mm -hmm. um, which I then anchor with the same anchor so that the bank builds up. Yeah. Um, and one of the things then, in NLP, they call it collapsing anchors, where you, uh, if you have a negative situation, you fire off your anchor and it collapses the existing emotional and cognitive, uh, the affective and cognitive situation. So we sound somewhat professional. Yep. Um, <laughs> you know, after, uh, mind you, I've had three months off, but, uh, you know, I, I haven't <laughs> talked about tooth rot and gum rot in the last three months. <laughs> Now and then, it's nice to, to to dredge up a technical term from from the. Mm -hmm. Would you do you mean kind of uh, the the mouth bones? What what are they called again? <laughs> yeah, that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So wherever we were on that, now that I've been distracted. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's yes. true, Christine. Yeah. Yes, very much so. Uh, the yeah. the more of the sensorium uh, you can use uh the better off so yeah. visual auditory kinesthetic olfactory and gustatory yeah. now the last two you've got to be a real visualizer in, a, in an expanded definition to be able to, to get full use of the last two but the first three uh most people can do and if you can take any anchor and 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 stick those three concepts to it mm -hmm. or, or three uh sensorial components it's going to be that much more powerful yeah indeed i quite like um pat mccarthy who's a doctor in new zealand has got a nice uh, variation on this where he calls it the the glasgow bouncer technique um and uh this this is the the bouncer who uh you know it, it, it ejects the the unwanted unruly thoughts and, and it only lets the nice ones in and he says you know the glasgow bouncer doesn't ask politely for, um, for the person to leave uh they are out on their arse <laughs> <laughs> having met pat i can relate to that <laughs> yeah it's a good technique there's marcello hello Hey, so oh, yes, hey, I, Marcello, yeah. nice to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> so at least we know somebody from South America is uh, is tuning in. So that's that's good. Yeah, please, please <laughs> to, pleased to see you again. Uh, indeed. Uh, so um, I'm trying to think, I mean, you we were talking about the, the monkey mind and the thoughts as well, and, and that really brought to mind some of the um, people like Michael Yapko, who, who talks about, um, you know, the, the inner critic. Um, and he has a, a lovely way of looking at the inner critic where he says, um, it's often difficult to, to change what it says. Um, and um, However, you can choose whether or not you believe it so it's not always necessarily true whether you are able to control it as a different matter so if we go back if we go back to stress mm -hmm. in, in the english language we use the word stress but it's actually broken down into a, two other concepts distress and you stress mm -hmm. and uh, one of my favorite descriptions is a roller coaster ride 
nature is parsimonious, cheap as hell. We're not going to build an extra molecule just because you want to go on the roller coaster. So we're going to use what's at hand. <laughs> you go up that roller coaster, you're, you're careening down that, that drop like there, there's no tomorrow and God knows if the brakes work or if the wretched cart will stay on the track. But the point is that your body is using the same fight or flight hormone responses that you're having a great time with. Now, if you're on the highway and suddenly your car starts careening in about the same way, you're not going to be enjoying the experience. So what we have to, to keep in mind is, is our interpretation. And this is where Michael's concept of, well, do I pay attention and do I believe it? And the answer to, to the monkey mind is no and no, never. Um, and the same with everything else. But what I think is absolutely critical is to realize that you're being sucked into that vortex of negativity and then stopping yourself. And, and this is where cognitive behavior therapeutic approaches come, come to play, um, where you stop the thought process long enough to realize that you've now got to be consciously making a decision about these thoughts versus just going along for the ride. So my, I, I, I tend to like Michael's perspective. Um, and just as a, a quick advertising for Michael's books, uh, he's the only psychologist in my entire career uh, that ever talked about hypnosis and depression. Mm -hmm. and using it with the depressed personality. Uh, all of the, the references before Michael would basically tell you to run the other way if you're dealing with a depressed person, never to use hypnosis with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that sense, he's had some truly interesting insights into uh, hypnosis and its applications. Yeah. Just, just as a quick ad I, for him. Yeah, no, and his books are fantastic, and he is also a phenomenal presenter as well. He, uh, you know, as a dentist, uh, as you say, sitting in on a, a hypnosis lecture from a psychologist about depression, it is actually massively entertaining, and uh, you know, he's <laughs> he he keeps you the whole time. He's excellent. Well, I, I, not only is he excellent, but he's got a, a to a degree of a lot of the mental health practitioners using hypnosis, Michael does tend to have a larger overview of the field. Yeah. Um, unlike a lot of them, which is, which is nice to see. Mm -hmm. So if you ever get a chance uh, to listen to Michael or buy one of his books, uh, highly recommended. And the other thing, uh, and I've got to give him intellectual uh, credit for acknowledging in his book on, on uh, mindfulness meditation mm -hmm. that it is. Um, with, with each ring, you feel less and less stressed. And no, I'm wondering why the wife isn't picking up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, first I was trying to identify the source of the noise. <laughs> so my orientation to reality is affected. Yeah. Uh, if if you look at mindfulness meditation, which is all the rage right now in psychology and mental health, it's not true mindfulness meditation. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a synthesized, applied meditative technique used by psychologists. And Michael, God bless him, acknowledges that in the introduction to his book. And very few of them ever do. Um, it's, it's a shame we don't have a lot of time to go into the full nature of meditative techniques and hypnotic techniques. Well, that's, that, that's going to be our next, uh, our next show. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do that. We will do it. I also realized here, I noticed that behind us, we've got our bookcases and they're, yes. they're, they're nicely, quite nicely lined up. Mine's maybe a little at an angle, but, uh, ironically, it's probably many of the same books that are sitting there. I would say because the, <laughs> the, the section that you see behind me is my hypnosis library. Okay. Um, with everything from ancient dental hypnosis books 
to yep. books that even you've got chapters in. So there you go. There you go. <laughs> Um, well, a, a full disclosure here. Mine; uh, these are my hypnosis books, but the the full hypnosis library is on the other side. Uh, these ones were uh, put in the side here because actually that's my whiskey cabinet, and I felt uh, ah. it wasn't professional to sit with all the whiskey behind me. So that's that's me letting you see behind the curtain there. <laughs> <laughs> on, on the other hand, uh, that's a good meditative technique as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is, but, but 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 actually, you know, we we started up uh, the dentistry whiskey appreciation group, and yes. um, it's a great, you know, whiskey is a great hobby. It's uh, each distillery from a, a beautiful, wonderful part of Scotland. Each bottle has its own story, uh, its own nuances, and it's it's a really fascinating um, uh, hobby to have. Um, with the caveat that you have to enjoy it responsibly and, and avoid yeah. the dependency, which is the serious part. I um I until I ended up in in your neighborhoods um I was I mean to me whiskey was whiskey I mean there was mm -hmm. one basic production technique and that was it having now had the opportunity to sample some of your finest from your different regions I have a mm -hmm. whole different approach to uh, uh, appreciation um, yeah. and my own cultural background we make brandies out of everything uh, plum being my favorite mm -hmm. um and i'm very fond of a good cognac and, and especially a, a fine armagnac but i've now become a, a a fan of whiskey excellent well we we have plans to have uh, dentistry whiskey meetings so uh, as soon as the world uh, gets rebooted um yeah <laughs> we'll uh, we'll enjoy a dram and uh, and some cpd yeah, that would be excellent <laughs> <laughs> but, but in all seriousness, we are going to meet again, and we're gonna we're gonna have a, a much fuller discussion about uh, dental hypnosis as well. Um, with regards to any other stress management techniques, is there anything else you uh, you can think of that's worthy of mention? Well, in in terms of of uh, stress management as a whole, and you started it out by defining the fact that it's not a single technique; it's a lifestyle. Yeah. So that you have to look at all domains of, of life and they have to be accounted for nutrition, exercise, uh, you name it, uh, in, including spirituality, which tends to be left out. Now, in terms of spirituality, um, depending on your, your, your background, um, for Catholics, uh, any one of the very short prayers is a nice way to turn it into a meditative process. Um, in terms of a more uh, esoteric approach, uh, there is from Hawaii, a thing known as self-identity ho'oponopono, which is based on the, uh, the, the following four statements. I love you, I'm sorry, please forgive me, thank you. And you just repeat that four statements in any order continuously for a predefined period of time, 10 minutes, five minutes before you go to bed. Uh, and right. And I would recommend anytime you want to uh, engender a physiologic change, do it at bedtime. Say the, what are the four statements again? I love you. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Please forgive me. Thank you. Okay. Now, I'm the, just hoping no, nobody's just tuned in at that one yes, particular bit. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in, in today's world, after a wee dram or five, who knows? Anything goes. <laughs> um, the, the point of those four statements is that they're not specific. They're generic statements made to the universe, and then they become self-reflexive. Mm -hmm. And everybody in terms of stress management talks about gratitude. In all of the meditative traditions, they talk about gratitude, expressing gratitude, mm -hmm. so that uh, finding some little prayer or mantra or, or uh, approach that, that you came across, an axiom someplace, mm -hmm. that you can repeat to yourself also tends to help with, with managing your stresses. Yeah. Uh, because what it does uh, on, a, on a 
purely mechanical basis is it becomes a thought object uh, where even the meaning of the thought object is not necessary. Yeah. But if you understand the meaning, it becomes a thought object which sets up a, an altered state of consciousness which will drive the parasympathetic nervous system for the physiologic response. Yeah. That's that's excellent. And actually, um, without really fully appreciating all of that, recently one of our, very sadly, one of our elderly cats was passing away. And the children, of course, were quite upset. The mm -hmm. cat was, was obviously in its final moments. Um, but it dawned on me to, to, to have my children saying goodbye to the cat was quite an emotional and sad thing to do. So instead, each of them stroked her as she was passing away and thanked her thanked her for for being a great cat and it actually really changed the emotion of the experience of of what they were going through that was good i was able to say that without getting teary as well that was good yes of course <laughs> I'm <quite impressed>. um. <laughs> um, and the, the other aspect of that when it comes to stress management um the the, the act of um charity and of giving is actually quite a therapeutic thing within itself you know, and, and you know, as I, as much as I can, I will, I will give and I'll, I'll support and help. But on the days where I've had a difficult morning at work, and I make my way to the, the the local sandwich shop to get my lunch, and I see the homeless guy sitting there on the pavement, especially on the days where I've had a you know a morning from hell, I'll reach into my pocket and give the guy a couple of quid because I think, well, the morning was terrible, but I've at least I've helped that guy. <laughs> <laughs> funny how that is in our business <laughs> um now the other the other technique i have recently come across it's not i guess especially a stress management technique but a problem solving technique that i think can be used when somebody is feeling stressed comes from this book here Marlene Hunter. Uh, oh, oh, Marlene. Do you, have you ever met Marlene? I have never met Marlene. Marlene, I, I don't know if she's still with us. I think she I'm is. not sure. No. Marlene, Marlene uh, lived in, in British Columbia. She hung out in um, Victoria, I think. Mm -hmm. And she, uh, she was a past president of the American Society of Hypnosis. She used to go to Cuba to teach hypnosis. Mm -hmm. um, she also set up a uh, basically a, almost a free clinic for uh, natives in um, British Columbia who were having addiction issues and stuff. And she would fly up to them once a month and hang out for a week or two. Uh, mm -hmm. She was, uh, 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 when she was active, she was a very, very uh, charming and insightful clinician. Mm -hmm. um, and not to mention a, 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 a very good actress. Oh, really, uh, she could play the role that the clinical context required, uh -huh. uh, which which is a skill set that, in terms of creating rapport with a, a patient, was was uh, very very important. And she had mm -hmm. this ability uh, to do this; it was amazing. Mm -hmm. She and she, she a very very lovely person. Uh, if, yeah. I don't know if she's with us. I hope she is. Um, and I haven't seen her now for years at any of the conferences, mm -hmm. uh, but she was also, as, as her book, very good at, at hypnosis. Yeah. I mean, this, this in itself could be a, a good uh, future um, uh, uh, broadcast as well, is actually reaching onto our, our shelves and pulling off books and, uh, uh, and talking about the person and the techniques. Oh, in, in, so indeed, indeed. Yes. There are phenomenal things out there. Now, I'd never, I bought this in a bundle of, of other books and uh, um, it sat there for a while. I didn't look at it. One day I was looking for some inspiration for a particular patient and I, I flicked through this book and realized it's actually packed full of, of really, really nice metaphors, stories and, and techniques. Uh, and it's quickly become one of my favorite little books um, for, for techniques. But there's one technique this in particular that I was going to share. Now, a lot of a lot of the techniques we use in hypnosis um, are kind of variations on other, other things we've he heard elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the concepts might seem a little similar, but they're they're repackaged or, or put in a different way. Now, this particular technique, Marlene calls the the three boxes technique. 
um, where sh she's talking about any any problem that's on your mind that you're struggling with. Now, this is obviously ordinarily done within the hypnotic trance, mm -hmm. um, but the person essentially um, creates three boxes. Um, they take the original problem and thing that's causing them stress, and they split it into three components. The, the, the first box, they put all the, the aspects of the, the, the problem that come from other people. Uh, and put it into the first box. The second box, she said, you take the things that are facts, things that can't be changed, it is just a, a fact. Um, whether that's something that happened in the past or whether it's um, you failed your exam or um, the, you know, the, the procedure with that patient went wrong, it's a fact, you put it in the second box. And she says, the first two boxes, other people and facts, you have very little control over. And so you punt them away, you fling them away into the distance. So they're, they're way on the horizon where you can barely see them because you've got no control over them. So why spend time worrying about that? The third box has your own name on it. And she said, that's all the parts of that particular problem or worry that you bring to it yourself. And she said, this is the one you need to open and look at all the little changes and the things that you can do something about. And it's, I think it's a nice way of, of, and I've used this myself with things that are on my mind. I, uh, I get rid of the stuff that I think, well, okay, I can't change that. Just float it away. What can I change? What can I do? I can't change that I didn't do X, Y, or Z yesterday, but I've got control over the fact that I can do that now. That's a, an artful repackaging of a concept that exists in, in, uh a myriad of variations, yeah. uh, both from, from philosophic perspectives to uh, um, actual applications, as, as in this. Um, yeah. As I say, she was quite the creative person. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the things I love about hypnosis is that, that, that there are so many different ways of packaging the therapy and, and, and the technique. Um, and, you know, if a particular approach isn't working or a person has trouble visualizing, I'm never concerned because there are a multitude of other approaches and ideas. Well, Erickson, uh, uh, the god of hypnosis from the 20th century, um, it used to say that there was no such thing as a bad hypnotic patient. It was just a poor hypnotist. Yeah. Um, I think that's one of, the, one of the things that makes hypnosis so fundamentally difficult to study and, and create evidence base behind because it's the technique is going to be different. The, the hypnotist is going to be different. The environment, there's so many variables. It makes it difficult. It's, it's an art. And, and the, yeah. the fellow I referenced earlier, uh, Weir, his first book was called uh, Trance, From Magic to Technology. Mm -hmm. uh, the bottom line of it is, is that we really are dealing with, with uh, the, the art of, of interacting as opposed to anything else. And there you, are, you can be quite personally talented. You may have to learn your talents and skills Mm -hmm. um, or you may be absolutely horrible at it, and yet it may still work. Yeah. And it may work well because at a certain point, it's not about you, it's, it's about the patient. Yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's a fantastic quote from the 60s, somebody called Stol Stolzenberg, yeah. who, who the, says... The general hypnosis, yes. Yeah, who says, the more training a practitioner has in hypnosis, the less they have to use it. And it's very true. It, it, uh, my phrase has always been not to be, not to do hypnosis, but to become hypnotic. Indeed, indeed. So, and that's that's the way you 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 walk into the operatory. The moment you walk in, you've you've read the signs. You listen to the symptoms, and then you just be. And it, yeah. it should ultimately flow. Yeah. 
Yeah. And that, you know, that's, it's certainly very valid as well that, you know, there are going to be challenges um, with that in the way we work uh, when we go back, because, you know, if we are meeting our patients while we have masks on and, and gear on that covers our faces, our patients are intuitively going to lose a lot of the, uh, the compassion that they see that we have towards them. Uh, and a, a great idea that I think we are going to use in the clinic is having a, a name badge that doesn't just have your name, but actually has a photograph of of you in normal attire. So um, the person, patient can still see you. Well, the odds are they'll probably see my mustache waving out from the side of the mask. So <laughs> <laughs> they know it's but, still you. Yeah. Uh, the other. I just the hope other... you should paint. You should paint a mustache over your mask. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should. Um, you know the 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 only. Uh, mitigating factor we have is that there has been enough media coverage now of, of healthcare practitioners dressed like they're going to the moon this is true. Uh, that the, uh, even the most phobic of patients will appreciate that you're, you're in your mm -hmm. costume for their benefit as, as much as yours. So yeah. Yeah. Um, it doesn't help on, on the subtleties, but what are you going to do? I, th I think for for patients who for who are familiar with you, I think it will it will be easier. I think if you're meeting a new patient for the first time, it will be tricky. Um, very much. And for that reason, I think virtual consultations, something like this, meeting somebody for the first time, um, and, and doing it over the computer. It it certainly has its advantages, and mm -hmm. will be a stress mitigator mm -hmm. because they can take a look at you and say, "Oh, okay, forget it. Too much facial hair." This guy's got a bent nose. No. <laughs> Where's he been sticking it, right? <laughs> Into somebody else's business. <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, dear. Um, are, are, are there any questions from our audience? Uh, I don't think uh, Christine has uh, given us a few things. Voice will become so important. Absolutely. Um, I think also understanding people aren't necessarily going to uh, hear us as well. We we get a lot of our understanding of the language by lip reading far more than we realize. And and when the the mouth is covered, there are certain things that will become harder to understand. Um, if you've ever seen the oh, what's the name of the effect? Um, oh, it'll come back to me. The, the when the person's face is covered and they're saying ba and va. And it mixes up. Um, I can't quite remember the name of it. I always think Stroop effect, but it isn't because that's colors no, and words. No. Um, I know it's not that. Um, it'll come back to me later. So yes, uh, announcing things properly and understanding that, uh, especially in Glasgow, we will need to speak very clearly. I would agree. <laughs> <laughs> Um, again, with regards to healthcare professionals and their own stress, what, what would you say are, I guess, the, the, the main summary points uh, that we should be making here for folk? Well, first, realize that you are exposed to stress. Size up your response to stress. Is mm -hmm. it you stress or is it distress? Mm -hmm. If it's you stress, figure out what you do that permits it to be you stress as opposed to distressful. Mm -hmm. And then figure out what in your life you're doing that is going to mitigate stress. Uh, well, let's, let's rephrase that. Mitigate the effects of stress. Um, stress, we can't, we can't, without stress, we'd be dead. So we mm -hmm. can't eliminate stress but we can mitigate the effects of stress based on, on things we do. And we've addressed those uh, physical issues, uh, mental issues, spiritual issues. Um, so you should put together some kind of program for yourself um, that encompasses each of these aspects mm -hmm. that you can follow, not slavishly, but, but on, on a consistent enough basis that even if you're going to be exposed to distress, uh, it won't be as impactful as if you didn't have any kind of 
methodology to deal with it at all. Yeah. I think the the key thing, you know, Christine's saying feeling a bit scared about going back, um, but if I don't, I'll become depressed. I, th I think one of the key things to remember as well is we all, you know, yes, it's been three months that we haven't haven't been working, but um, you know, we all have the, the the skills, the abilities. There's going to be some change and some adaptions, but we are nothing if not adaptable in, in what we do. Our whole day is spent adapting to stressful situations when we're dealing with. Uh, you know, an influx of, of patients and, and things that are unexpected. It's kind of what, what we do in our day-to-day -day work. Now, um, as much as is possible, um, it's take things easy on yourself as you're going back um you know be aware of the fact that obviously because it's weird when you go back to work after you've been off for two weeks let alone three months um so be kind to yourself and, and understand that you aren't necessarily going to be able to work at exactly the same pace we're not going to be anyway you know we aren't. i i think it was 1985 when lou dubin came up from Philadelphia to do a, 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 a workshop for the Ontario Society of Hypnosis. Now, Lou Dubin, for people that may not be familiar with the name, was a past president of the American Society, also involved with the Board of, of, of Dentistry, Dental Hypnosis. He was also an oral surgeon, a board certified psychologist, and a diplomat of forensic dentistry. He was about five feet two, bald as a cue ball with a poncho via mustache. Mm -hmm. Now, to put him in historical context, he was one of Merrill's marauders during the Second World War. These were folks that marched all the way from one side of the Philippines to the others to engage the enemy. They were tough as nails. And when you saw Lou... You looked at him, and even before he opened his mouth, your question was, how high do you want me to jump? I mean, it was just taken for granted. Um, his, his, his aura filled the room. And during this workshop, he started it uh, with a, a statement that I, I will paraphrase the part I remember. And basically, he said, strive for the best that you can do not perfection mm -hmm. so that when you get back to work do the best you can that day and don't beat yourself up over the fact that you may not be able to to tell you a little story last week uh my staff and i were doing the deep clean on the office in preparation for tomorrow we were going to start in our staff room area and work to the front of the office when my receptionist goes Come and take a look at this. My hot water tank had burst and was leaking all over the floor. Uh, getting a plumber on short notice is a major trick on a good day, never mind in a pandemic. Uh, so it took two days to get the water heater replaced. I don't know what the price is going to be. I haven't looked at that yet. Remembering that I haven't earned a farthing uh, in three months. <laughs> so... You know, in my younger days, I would have been bent out of shape about it. Today, I'm going with the flow. It is what it is. Yeah. Um, I have a full day of patience booked. So we'll go from there. Yeah. And we'll, we see how it turns out. The, the the story you told there actually reminded me of um, something that Betty Alice Erickson said once mm -hmm. in, a in a workshop. Now, Betty Alice, Alice, as you know, was Milton Erickson, who you mentioned, uh, his daughter. Yes. Um, she has sadly passed away, uh, Betty yes. Alice. Not now, that long ago. It was not long ago. But she, she came to Scotland a few years ago and she gave a fantastic workshop. And at the end of the workshop, um, one of the, uh, the delegates raised their hand at question time to ask a question. And the question was, do you ever find it hard being compared to your father all the time? Because she's obviously gone into a line of work where, as you said, her father is the god of hypnosis. Uh, hypnosis yes. I mean, how, how do you stand up and talk with, with the surname Erickson, you know? <laughs> and she gave a phenomenal answer. She said, hey, this is this is the best I've got," she said. "I'll, I'll stand, and I, what I can promise you 
is I will give you the best that I've got. There's no point in me comparing that to my father, to anybody else. This is me and this is the best I got. And hey, do you know what? If you don't think it's good enough, that's your problem. <laughs> well, she's right. Do, do you know Do you know Kay Thompson? Did you ever I, I've, Kay Thompson? I, I never met her, sadly, but I've listened to her recordings and read her. She's got a wonderful okay. book um, that Karen Olness put together. Yes, I think. yeah. 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 Uh, Karen and uh, um, oh, her name will come to me. Um, I knew Kay. I knew Kay. Mm -hmm. And um, and the book, it, it's emphasized, and Kay emphasized this herself in, in person, was the fact that People would call her an Ericksonian, mm -hmm. but she's not an Ericksonian. She is a Thompsonian. She is herself, yeah. and uh, she she can't be compared to Erickson. Yeah. Um, and in that sense, the only comparison you have is or should have is to yourself. Ignore everybody else and do the best you can that day, and that yeah. that should mitigate your stress going back to not the unknown. Because I mean. In my training, we were all in the OR mm -hmm. uh, with patients. I assume you were similarly trained. Well, <clears throat> if you if you get dressed up, and I remember the first time I was in the OR with the surgeon, uh, I, I spent 16 years working at the psychiatric hospital in the dental department uh, on a part-time basis. And we would take patients to the general hospital for, for oral surgery. And of course, everybody would be frightened out of their minds by these patients. Mm -hmm. We'd have like a, a group of six people there to look after this one patient. Well, I'm in the OR and I made the, the, the horrific mistake of touching the IV pole. I, I, I was moving it aside and I touched it. Well, the nurses had a, a conniption. They uh, immediately, they had to strip me naked and scrub me down again and then back I go. Well, okay, that's great for general clean, clean surgery in an OR. This was the oral cavity in 28 severely rotted, decayed, and abscessed teeth. Um, but if you can get through that kind of experience, then a day in the office dressed in a, in a level four biohazard suit, I mean, what, what, what's the difference? <laughs> this is true. Uh, it reminded me of uh, Code 23, that's what it is, I think. It's uh, Monsters, Inc., where the uh, the sock is in the back of the monster and they get shaved. That's what it reminded me of. <laughs> um, yes, uh, I, I remembered as well, The it was the McGurk effect was the thing I was talking about. Okay. Bah, and that's called the McGurk. And if you look it up on YouTube, it's, it's fascinating. Um, very interesting. Um Yes, Christine asked another uh, another couple of questions. What have we got? She's asking, what are you doing tomorrow? Are you seeing emergencies only? No, actually, we've been. I've been seeing my emergencies for the last three months. 80% uh, were done over the phone. 20% I physically had to see in my level four biohazard suit. Okay. Um, tomorrow. See, the, diff the, the difference is um, England tomorrow, uh, it's the first day that they can go back and, and physically face to face with patients. Now, um, to, we've been given the permission to do essential dentistry. Which, okay. Yeah, we've had uh, hubs, hubs to do that. I guess I don't know if it's more if, if it's more difficult, if it's more rural in Canada. I mean, I would imagine that's very difficult in uh, Newfoundland or, or some of the remote areas if there was only a hub that was available, you know. It's a four, four day round trip, you know. Yeah. PEI, Prince Edward Island, yeah. has 13 dentists yeah. for whatever size population, which is uh, yeah. probably some suburb of Glasgow has more people than they do. Um, depending on where you are, yeah, it's going to be a bit of a challenge or more of a challenge. Um, so tomorrow I'm going back to within our new guidelines with 15 minutes between patients. Uh, and because I do laser dentistry, I get done faster anyway. Yeah. Um, so there'll be plenty of time for, for the operatory to, to dry up after it's, excuse me, hosed down with disinfectant and the rest. Um, so I'm seeing the people I sent off to the endodontist uh, during the three months. I'm doing final fillings, a crown prep, and, and a few other things that have to be done because they're just going to get much worse if we don't get at them now. Mm -hmm. And slowly but surely, we'll get back up to some degree of speed. Um, 
but we won't be seeing anywhere near the number of patients um, per day. Yeah. Uh, according to our current guidelines, it's 50 minutes between patients okay. for fallow time on the operatory. A week before that, depending on the hour change, the air changes per hour, hmm. if you had only two, it was three hours between patients. Wow. I have 14 in my operatory without doing a thing. So I was down to half an hour. So I've, I've gained 15 minutes under the new guidelines. Okay. Yeah. I think, I mean, this is, again, we don't necessarily want to get into too many specifics. Uh, Christine's asking, what advice would you give to dental hygienists and therapists expected to go back with no extra pr protection, drop in salary and still no nurse? You know, it's very hard for us to give you any uh, opinion or advice uh, necessarily on the politics of things, but... My my advice, Christine, would be uh, you've got three boxes there and you can fill uh, a lot of those points in box number one and number two uh, and then and then try and deal with the situation because it's it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. My answer to that is it depends on what kind of guidelines you're being uh, uh, returned to work under. Here, everybody in the office has to be similarly adorned. Mm -hmm. um, the patient is expected to come to the office in a mask. Failing that, we give them a mask, uh, which they have to wear in the office until such time as they're in the chair. Uh, mm -hmm. All of the staff are meant to um, hang out uh, in masks, keeping the six feet distance between us. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as elf air filtration is concerned, um, there has been a whole bunch of... of uh, argument over air filtration um, yeah. and our guidelines were drawn up with the uh, perspective of the least uh, noisome demands. Um, even with air filtration, right now the guidelines say 15 minutes. Uh, if I had 15 air exchanges an hour, with, which could be done with filtration, then I could have cut that down to eight minutes between patients. Mm -hmm. But eight minutes, 15 minutes. I'm at that stage in my career where I don't want to work that fast anymore. I gave up the roller skates a long time ago. Uh, not to mention that I'm going to use that extra time building further rapport with the patients. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, yes, yeah, so as I say, the politics are are definitely very difficult, and that's that's part of the reason why we decided to have this discussion now and change it from uh, the original kind of concept of let's talk about only dental hypnosis to to, to talking about hopefully concepts and ideas behind some of this that that people can personally get a bit of benefit from. Um, you know, the, the, and. Uh, techniques and medita meditation uh, as well. But I think as a, 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 if you're feeling stressed about going back to work tomorrow, next week, w whenever it is going to be, um, I think my, uh, my feelings would be, first of all, make sure you're getting a good rest. Um, you know, set, set an alarm on your phone that says, go to bed. I actually have to do this because I'm a night owl and I will stay up till three and Gabor knows this because I've spoken to him and he's going to bed and it's five hours before, you know, earlier in, in uh, Hamilton. Um, so I need to set an alarm on my phone, uh, you know, about half 11 midnight that says, right, it's, it's time to go to bed. Um, diet as well. Um, you have complete control over the fuel that you're putting into your body. Um, you know, you you get out what you put in. So if you eat crap, you will feel like crap. Um, so again, I've got to be conscious of this as well because I I, I love a, a crisp or as you guys would call it, a potato chip. Uh, that is my uh, barbecued. <laughs> any any flavor any flavor it's my it's my kryptonite and um and i get that little uh, burst of endorphins when i when i polish off a, a packet of crisps and i have to i have to appreciate and understand that that ain't going to make me feel good in the long run so um it's it's making the conscious decision when you're in the shops you know when we talk about habit for formation um you know stopping smoking 
um, isn't about not smoking the cigarette. There are a multitude of steps before that. It's it's the standing in the the, the store, looking at the cigarettes behind the counter and making the decision not to buy them um, is, is the first step. So when it comes to your diet, when you're going around the grocery store, um, the supermarket, um, make sensible choices. If you've got good, wholesome foods in your fridge and in your cupboards, then you are going to eat good, wholesome food and you are going to feel better. Um, so that that is really important. Um, I'm, I'm going to give you a piece of advice my late mm -hmm. father gave me. And uh, you've got to put my old man into context, God rest him. He grew up during the Depression. He participated on the wrong side in the Second World War, spent two and a half years as a prison of war in Russia after the Second War, came back to a depressed Hungary back in the day, took part in a revolution, came here, had a divorce somewhere in the middle of all of this. Um, and he said there were three things they can't take away from you. What you eat, what you learn, and your sense of humor. Well, sadly, I'm at that age now where what I learned I've managed to forget, and the hard drive just isn't accepting new files. <laughs> and when I go searching, it, it pops 404 all the time. Page is missing. What I eat, well, Lord knows uh, I've got to be careful and behave and all that other silliness. But it's your sense of humor. Even in the worst of times, my black sense of humor hasn't gone away. So regardless of how stressed you are, whatever your fears are about going back to work, fuel the sense of humor and yeah. keep that going. Uh, because I think that will do a great deal of good for anyone who's feeling a little bit out of sorts. Yeah, that, that is so true. I, uh, yeah, I, I actually recently was on a, a lengthy car ride and I thought, you know, I, I need to stay awake. I had to drive to Heathrow and back in a single day, which from Glasgow is is quite a trip. Um, I was taking somebody to the airport that was uh, on a repatriation flight. And on the way back up the road after about the 12th hour of driving, I thought, how do I engage my brain? Music isn't going to do it. Um, I'm not going to listen to a lecture. Um, so I put on some Kevin Bridges, who is a Glaswegian comedian, and the last couple of hours were just a complete joy. Um, so humor, humor is massively therapeutic. Very much so. Yeah. Whether it's for you or for the patient or both, Indeed. preferably both. Indeed. Um, you have to make sure you're using humor appropriately, appropriately with the right patient. So you need to know your patient if you're going to use humor with them because it can, it can backfire. <laughs> And very much sadly. <laughs> um, okay, so next I've got a few a few last uh, pointers. Um, uh, talking, you know, um, uh, having conversations with people. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes the people who are, I guess, the closest to you, uh, it can be hard to have conversations with. So having, uh, you know, having a good friend, um, somebody who you know you can rely on, <clears throat> becomes really important. They, they don't need anything back from you. They just need to be an ear. Um, so that that is uh, that is hugely important. And making sure the friends that you have around you are radiators and not drains is important as well. Um, if, if all your friends are drains, um, it can get rather tiring. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I mentioned the helping others and the, the charitable acts as well. Um, as hard as things are just now, um, go out your way to, to do something charitable, help somebody else. And um, it not only will benefit humanity and the world, um, but you will get the, uh, the feel good factor. If you're going to become... Uh, I guess, addicted to doing something, then why not um, something that's helping somebody else uh, as well, engage in hobbies. And I think, you know, we've, we've all had this downtime where we've perhaps been engaging in, in various other activities and things as well. And I think it's important if you've found something that you've engaged with and you've enjoyed, you know, as you get back to work, be absolutely sure that you make time to continue doing whatever it is that you've you've enjoyed as well. Um, 
and nature was the final one. And again, you, you made that point, um, nature. Now, I, I can certainly testify to this when I, I told you about, um, you know, going fishing. Um, but a number of years ago, sadly, my, my business partner and friend um, sadly committed suicide, um, which was a particularly, I mean, it was a, it's a horrendous thing anyway, and a very difficult thing on a, a multitude of emotional levels to, to deal with. Um, you know, the feeling the grief and, and the loss of losing somebody, but but also the the sense of guilt, which is is hugely interesting and in, in, in knowing that there isn't anything that I, even looking back, knowingly could have done. There's always going to be that level of guilt. And, and interestingly, using some of Michael Yapko's concepts of uh, almost hearing and, and appreciating that you're going to have those feelings, but they're not necessarily accurate, was quite a useful thing uh, to, to, to shift the mindset with that. That it's okay, my brain is going to say to me at times, you should have known, you should have seen the signs. It's going to say those things. It's not necessarily going to be true. Um, um, it's quite helpful. The, the 448 breathing technique I found very useful at that time. Um, for the first time in my life, um, two or three weeks after it happened, I could feel panic attacks building up and I'd never had that in my life. Um, and the four, four, eight breathing, breathing in for four, holding for four, breathing out for eight, actually brought that down. It stopped it from escalating any further. Um, but the big one for me was nature. Um, I, I realized that I had to put my phone down. I had to turn off the laptop. I had to leave them in the house and just go for a walk in the fields and, and, and get to somewhere where I thought there's nobody around me for about a mile. And it's just me and the trees and the grass and the wind. Um, so nature can be hugely therapeutic. Uh, Christine there has just mentioned loneliness, um, something to touch on. Of course, there are a lot of people who are obviously isolated or have reduced um, contact with people just now. And, and that, of course, is a huge thing. So, you know, and, and make sure you engage with people, pick up the phone, talk to folk. Um, as, as much as is possible. And, and similarly, if you have a friend or a family member who you know lives alone, um, you know, make the call, phone them up just for no other reason than to say hello. Um, it's worth it. Love you guys. Thank you. Um, now, Christine, you, you had a, a comment earlier on um, that might explain uh, that last one. Where has it gone? There you go. So uh, I need advice on how to give up on drinking red wine. Are you drinking red wine just now? <laughs> Um, um, for, I, I would say mix red and white to get pink first and, and then work to white and then try milk after that, perhaps. Um, yeah. But I wonder, I mean, obviously there, there's, an, a, there's an effect alcohol physio, you know, physically will, will, will give, but if it's, if it's the anchor, if it's the physical, you, you know, you see people that go into a pub, okay, and they've had a stressful day at work and they get a pint of lager or a pint of beer, or a, a whiskey, whatever it is, and they take a drink. Oh, that's better. I needed that. The stuff isn't even out your esophagus. It's, it's, it's hardly hit the stomach. It's certainly the alcohol certainly not had time to diffuse into the bloodstream yet. So but, it's, it's a, it, but it's an anchor. It's an anchor. It's an anchor. It's not the alcohol. It's, it's the, the mindset of this is going to make me feel better. And now I feel better. Well, the other side of that too is it's it's the golden uh, mean, if you will, everything in its proportion. Uh, basically, there's nothing wrong with with a good with a good red wine, um, uh, both physiologically and and psychologically. It's an excellent yeah. uh, form of nutrition and has some benefits and. Certainly European medicine tends to favor it more than North American medicine does. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it's knowing your limit. Mm -hmm. It's knowing when it's excessive, when it's addictive. Uh, in my family, sadly, there was a history of alcoholics, many of them. Um, and the consequences of that uh, addiction was not pretty, yeah. uh, both to the individual or to their immediate family members. So at the end of the day, you have to know yourself well enough, which is a very old concept, uh, Socratic, if, if I'm not wrong, know yourself, 
um, that one drink is fi uh, fine, two drinks is is not fine. Mm -hmm. um, if you if you know your limit and you stick within that limit, there's nothing wrong with enjoying it. It's understanding yourself and your limitations. Yeah. I think for me, that's uh, as far as wine is concerned, it's one of the reasons why I rarely drink wine is because uh, my, my wife doesn't. Uh, my, obviously, my kids aren't old enough. So if I open a bottle of, of wine, um, then the whole bottle is open. And, and if you leave it, the good things about enjoying a whiskey is that the whole point is you take the lid, you have one, and, and the cork goes back on and, um, and the whiskey is good. Certainly at the price of a whiskey, <laughs> one shot is all you can afford. <laughs> indeed, indeed. But I think if, if you are seriously looking at uh, any form of uh, uh, habit substitution or, or um, you know, if you, if you really want to stop something or, or change a habit, there are a multitude of, of techniques and things that can be done to do that. And, and, you know, I believe most of the time, if you're going to do that, the trick is to replace it with something that has, at the very minimum, um, similar things that it gives you. And I'm not talking about physically necessarily, but the same uh, uh, I, I, the same sense of, of relaxation and, and joy. So stopping smoking, for example. Um, and again, Pat McCarthy talks about this. He, you know, he says, uh, imagine you, a kid is sitting playing with a, a toy and you go up and you say, I'm going to, I want the toy and you try and wrestle it off them. Uh, you're going to have a fight. Um, if you approach the child with something that looks shinier and looks more interesting, you've got a half chance at swapping it. So I would say, Christine, um, I would I, I would look at something else that you can also do that will help you uh, anchor your inner, uh, your inner wine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there you go. Um, so yes, I think um, we've been we've been uh, gassing away for nearly two hours now. Believe it or not, I can believe it. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and that has been very therapeutic. I've in, I've enjoyed. Uh, oh, I've I've kind of forgotten. I don't know if there's anybody still watching. It may may well just be me, you, and Christine. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> it could very well be. <laughs> Um, so you you do need to get your sleep because uh, you are. Oh, I've, I've uh, tomorrow is going to be exciting. It's Interesting, going to be exciting. Yeah, uh, but you're not feeling stressed about it. No, no, not at all. I, after forty years near a dental drill, um, having worked in private practice, solo practice, group practice, and, and the hospital. Um, it's just another day in the neighborhood with whatever the neighborhood brings me. Yeah. And uh, I'm at that stage where, and I would never have imagined it of myself, but I tend to go with the flow. I don't let too much bother me anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and I practice a lot of the stuff we've talked about um, so that it shouldn't bother me. Yeah. Well, I think that's true. And, and as you say, you look back over, uh, dentistry i mean we we adapt with new technology uh you know digital dentistry lasers um computer controlled injections there's a whole myriad of new technology that we adapt to uh you look back to the 1980s and and the change in ppe um that that, that happened that must have been quite uh, stressful for a lot of old school dentists that well, never, it, know, to, to put it in context when i was in dental school we didn't wear masks and we didn't have rubber gloves. Yeah. If you were going to do a, a messy scaling uh, and you asked for a pair of gloves, they wanted to know if the patient had hepatitis B. Yeah. Um, it, it was almost a, an act of treason to ask for a pair of gloves, um, especially when you didn't want blood under your fingernails. I mean, that's what it boiled down to. Yeah. Well, I, I, grad, I started practice in 84 I started at the hospital in 86. Um, and the first day I worked barehanded, the next day I put on my gloves and my mask and I never took them off again. Mm -hmm. And it had nothing to do with, with uh, uh, we, uh, that was about the time that HIV became a big issue. 
Uh, it had more to do with just a sense of, of I can keep my hands cleaner and it's a far safer uh, approach, especially with psychiatric patients um, where they are. I've been exposed to every known communicable disease out there, hmm. um, which is, again, another reason perhaps I'm not phased by by the virus. Uh, but then again, I'm at the other end of my, my career, so... But again, it is funny. This, you know, the concept of of uh, change. Uh, you know, to look back on on an era where where nobody wore gloves at all uh, it seems unfathomable now to, to, oh, to the, the new generation. Uh, you know, reusable needles. You know, um, just unthinkable. I kept a fellow's practice alive while he was recovering from a heart attack, where um, he had a large bore, large gauge needles that were sharpened and sterilized in an oil sterilizer, um, which goes back to the fifties. Never mind. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, change is part of our profession. It's part of all mm -hmm. professions. And, and again, well, you're right. And we, we adapt to it. I mean, yeah. uh, it's now so, it's now so conditioned within me that I, I can, of an evening with my youngest child, have a toothbrush and with my clean hands, get in his mouth and clean his teeth, bring the same child to me for his dental checkup. I couldn't go near him without a set of gloves of, of on. Of course, of course. And I can't, <laughs> I, I, I won't sit down at the chair without my loops as well. Yeah. Because <laughs> suddenly I can't see the oral cavity. I mean, how is it that that happens? Yeah. But I mean, to put it into, into I, I don't know, where most of the folks, if, if anybody's listening at all, fall into. But I, I was taught when you asked it at your tooth, it was 60 seconds. You never touch the dentin or the universe will implode on itself. Yeah. And then some Japanese dude says, hey, let's total etch for 15 seconds, and it works just as well. Mm -hmm. um, when I graduated, within a couple of weeks, they were offering lab-fabricated resin veneers. Two weeks after that, I went to my first uh, course on porcelain veneers. Mm -hmm. um, the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry was formed uh, the year I graduated in 84. So, you know, then I look at the stuff I, I don't even take for granted. I, I just, oh, yeah, veneer. Okay, let's do it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's it, it, to, I, I like a phrase from Star Trek because I'm a trekker from way back. It's uh, from the second gener uh, from the next generation. Uh, the Borg resistance is futile, <laughs> <laughs> so you might as well just go with the flow. Just assimilate. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's the same mm -hmm. with stress. Yeah, I ignore it; it'll go away. Yeah, and, and I think a lot of the uh, obviously a lot of the changes and the things that are happening. Um, you know, we we will in time look back on, and uh, it will seem par for the course. Even though there is confusion and and things oh. are uncertain just now, uh, a lot of it won't necessarily even last for for long or forever. Um, I think we'll see certain elements of it that will stay with us, and we will in twenty years' time be looking back at how dentistry changed at the, in the time of COVID. You will be looking at it in twenty years' time. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I hope to be on a hammock someplace on a beach in Tahiti. <laughs> looking at the looking at the inside of a whiskey glass. <laughs> Preferably, yes. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Indeed. Um so we're 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 gonna do this again. We're we're gonna have a sit down and a conversation um I I guess more specifically on hypnosis uh we'll field some questions we'll get this out there uh and we shall talk a little bit about um i guess both of our experience and uh understanding of, of hypnosis generally uh, and that will be as an introduction for anybody who has no experience in it but also hopefully a few interesting little nuggets for people that are already using it as well i'm looking forward to that it will be good. And as I say, in the meantime, for, for anyone that's listening, um, 
everything will be okay. You are you're going to be absolutely fine. Uh, look out for the rest of your team. Look out for your staff. Um, give them some, some support if they are showing any signs of stress. Um, look out for each other. There's there's also been a little bit. I don't know if it's been the same in North America. There's been a, a little bit of a, a, I guess a climate of frustration among dentistry. So there's there's been a lot of uh, um, you know arguments and things on different dental forums um, and, and obviously people not happy with the uh, the governance and guidance uh, from above. Um, but I really think we need to put our energy into moving through this and moving forwards in a, as in as constructive a way as we can, um, and, and uh, that's that's important. Quite right. Um, the one thing about the dental world is, if it's happening in Calcutta, it's happening in Toronto, and yeah. I'm sure it's happening in Glasgow, and everybody's uh, complaining about it in the same fashion. Indeed. It's a different language, especially Glasgow. Well, as, as a, perhaps a finishing thought, many years ago, there was an international uh, society of hypnosis meeting in San Diego. Mm -hmm. uh, myself, Vic Rausch, a psychologist from uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, and a German dentist were all playing hooky one afternoon at the bar having a beer. Now, if you had been the waiter or a fly on the wall, you would not have understood that we were from different places in different professions because everything we were complaining about, everything we grudged about was identical. Government, patients, business, you name it, it was the same complaints. Yeah. So it's the same everywhere. We're all going through it the same. The dust will settle eventually. We just have to be patient and uh, go with the flow. Indeed. And you know, of course, it doesn't matter who you vote for because the government always get in. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Well, as I say, I have thoroughly enjoyed that. We're now just over the two-hour mark, so I think we we should uh, we should draw a line under it. Um, obviously, this will be um, on social media, so it can be watched again by anybody. If, if if you've tuned in and only seen part of it, you can go back and listen from the beginning. And we absolutely hope you'll join us again to have a a, a chat on hypnosis. God willing. Indeed. Thank you so much, and uh, I hope it all goes well tomorrow. Well, you may read about me if it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, stay safe and stay safe, everybody. Thanks Same for joining to you. us. Be good. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.